call to order the committee of the whole meeting for Tuesday, October, right, Tuesday, October 19th. Uh, first item on the agenda is roll call. Hi, good evening. Um, is Tom Connolly officially sworn in? Yes. Thank you. I'll add him to the list. Okay, Miller? Here. Rosado? Here. Beck? Here. Connolly? Here. Tanzan? Sofa? Here. Wolf? Here. Darren? Here. Lehman? Here. Ayazi? Uh, here. Malay? Here. Ewer? Here. Throne? Here. And Vogel Singer? Here. We have 13 out of 14. Okay. And up next is item number two. Reminder to please speak directly into the microphone for BATV. And if you don't want to pull your mask down, just talk loud. Um, <laughs> item number three is items to be removed, added, or changed. Um, yes, we have uh, an executive session that's necessary this evening, and the uh, topic is collective bargaining. Okay. So we will add an executive session as uh, 8A, <clears throat> tonight's agenda. And members of city council should have received an email from me with the uh, login instructions for the executive session. Does everybody that's online have that? Or have ability to check and make sure they have it. Cool. I got two thumbs up. I saw it. Yep. Okay. Great. Good. All right. Then we will move on to matters from the public. Is there anybody online? Because I don't see anybody in the room. No. There are okay. no, nobody from the public. We will then move on to item number five, which is a discussion on lowering the speed limit in residential areas from 30 to 25 miles per hour. Hey. Laura. Thank you. Um, not too long ago, I sent you a, a brief memo that provided some background on uh, previous discussions that the city council has had on this matter of um, citywide lowering of the speed limit in res on residential streets from uh, 30 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour. Um, the police department provided me with uh, the statistics for roadway crashes from 2019 to 2021 for the period January 1 through the end of September. And as you can, in uh, 2019, we had 429. In 2020, we had 326. And in 2021, we had only 316, which uh, represents a 26% um, a 26% decrease from 2019 to 2021. The last time that City Council discussed this topic um, in depth was back in 2015. And at that time, they directed staff to determine whether the city had authority to change the speed limit in residential areas, and then uh, what would be the requirements in order to do so. So after researching current state law, uh, we found that a, we would be able to uh, lower the speed limit, but a comprehensive citywide speed study would need to be performed. Um, and in order to provide the data necessary to determine if lowering residential speed limits was justified, um, we would have to provide a tremendous amount of data because it is a street by street analysis. It isn't something where we're able to generalize based on um, a study of one area or uh, several distinct areas. It's really a street by street um, analysis of the speeds that are being traveled, of uh, the number of vehicles on the street, the numbers of pedestrians and, um, and bicyclists using the street, um, the number of cars that are parked on the street, as well as all of the geometry of the streets. Um, and, and that, again, is on a street by street basis. That and the um, cost between the materials and labor to replace all of our current signage um, together would be close to $100,000. And at that time, city council felt that the cost was prohibitive, especially given the very low number of speed related um, incidents that were being experienced on residential streets. Um, also, as part of their research, they uh, 
found some studies conducted by the Federal Highway Authority that um, showed that setting speed limits that are less than 85% of the speed that free-flowing traffic is already traveling um, doesn't really encourage compliance with the posted speed limit and that people tend to continue to travel at um, the same rate of speed as before. However, if we do decrease the speed limit, we would need a lot more enforcement because there would be um, a greater number of people who would be exceeding the speed limit and taking the limited police resources that we have away from policing responsibilities or creating the need to increase our force. Um, there are other strategies that could be employed and as part of our strategic action plan, we do have um, an objective that is related to traffic calming, which uh, are exactly the types of strategies, um, alternative strategies that we might employ short of doing a reduction of the speed limit. Things like targeted enforcement in problem areas, um, that certainly has been one strategy that we have used in the past very successfully. Um, speed humps. We would not recommend speed bumps because um, speed bumps have been shown to be ineffective unless they are numerous, and that just uh, presents a lot of problems both for the motoring public and then also for the Public Works Department to uh, maintain those. But even speed humps may not be practical in our area where uh, we get an awful lot of snowfall and they present um, an impediment to effective snow plowing. Uh, the use of bump outs and um, or you know other things that change the geometry of the roadway, such as chicanes, which is um, altering the path of the roadway, um, tilting it one way, coming back the other way. Um, uh, and then also traffic circles are, are sometimes employed in areas where people kind of fly through intersections in order to calm the traffic. Addition of a double yellow center line uh, gives the perception to people that the lanes are narrower and they tend to reduce their speed in that situation. And I think a, a real essential element of all of this is public education because um, typically the people who are exceeding the speed limit in residential areas tend to live right there in that same residential neighborhood. And so it's just, uh, and one of the things we've done is, uh, in the past that's been pretty effective is our slow down campaign. Now, we've done that three or four times already, and I think the black and yellow signs maybe are starting to become a little invisible to people, so it might be necessary for us to uh, refresh that and come up with something new and clever to catch people's eyes. But, um, and based on our mid-year discussions, uh, Gary Holm presented a proposal that $100,000 be added to the Streets Department budget in years one to five of that overall plan for measures to be identified as part of a traffic calming strategic plan objective that we have. And that amount could certainly be increased if City Council decides that that's necessary. And, um, but we just wanted to sort of share that information as you approach your discussion. Certainly, we stand ready to uh, create a working group to focus on conducting a citywide traffic study to identify the problem areas and then to recommend measures that are targeted to solve the specific issues that are uh, found as a result. Okay, who wants to start off with questions? I have a comment. Okay, go ahead. So, Ward 1, Woodland Hills Road has the racing stripes instead of curbs now. And as soon as people turn off of Wilson Street, it is instant, they do instantly gun it, basically. Speed on down south. I'm just not sure that, and I have a speed limit sign right in my yard. I don't know if making that number 30, uh, 25 as opposed to 30 is going to make any difference with the people turning off um, right or left, just to, whichever way they're turning on to Woodland Hills Road or coming from the apartments across the street to stop them from as soon as they cross Wilson. I mean, because you can hear it. You, I'm sitting out in my driveway all the time. You hear them just, you know, put the pedal to the metal, so to speak. And I'm just not sure that, like I said, changing 30 to 25 is going to make any difference on that particular road. 
that, that I'm just relating my own personal experience. Yeah. I know that recently, though, they did put up in front of uh, the house right down the street from me to the south, one of those traffic, traffic control, the radar type of uh, yes. speed limit digital sign, which uh, I believe has helped at least a little bit for the time being to remind people there's no reason to decide you're going to try to get up to 45 before you get to that first stop sign, you know. It's interesting that you mentioned that, Alderman <clears throat> Sulfa, because um, uh, one of our staff members mentioned today, they make the digital sign now where you can make it have a smiley face if you get like 5% or less over the speed limit. And so it actually has the, uh, it changes people's behavior to try to get the sign to change to a smiley face. I think Western Avenue in Geneva has one like that. Yeah, that's what I heard. I've never seen a smiley face, so I guess I'm a <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. And when you say chicane, all That's I think is hanging the back end out, sliding through the turns. So <laughs> it's not a good thing for me to hear. Abby? Um, a couple of years ago, I went to the Bike Walk Places Conference, and there was this session with a, an urban planning firm out of uh, somewhere in the Netherlands. I don't remember exactly where. And they have a uh, stateside office as well. But they were saying that... Um, in, I think it was Amsterdam, the police don't actually enforce speed limits in their residentials or in their downtowns, that if somebody is speeding in those areas, they see it as a city planning problem and it's up to city staff to fix. Um, and, and to Laura's point about the 85, uh, 80, 85 rule, um, we have to make this, the roads less comfortable, either through nudges like signs and other things or physically making it less that perceived discomfort um, driving quickly down a road like Woodland Hills or Western Avenue. Um, they're wide open, so it's really easy to go fast. Um, so I love the idea of working through a lot of those problem areas and thinking through these traffic calming measures that kind of provide that incentive and discomfort factor a little bit to make people slow down instead. Yeah, because I'll agree with Chris, I hear all the time People come off of Van Ortwork onto Main Street, and I can hear every shift going up Main Street, you know, as they head west. It's just like, as soon as you make that right-hand turn off of that, you hear them open wide up and take off. My now, dad used to throw tennis balls at cars going by. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend that, because I still hear I don't know if that would be people. a really good idea. <laughs> I've, been like, I've been like the old guy in the Simpsons, Jones. Yeah, what exactly. are you <laughs> And I do that all the time because my street is actually a cut through when kids decide they leave the high school in one street. They take one street on Whipple and then the other one on mine, and they say you can get to Walnut first. Mm -hmm. So I hear that all the time out there. Nick, I see your hand is up. Thank you very much. Uh, Laura, thanks for the uh, uh, reminder memo. Um, I know we had talked about it, and, and Dan brought it up last week. I know this had been a discussion, and, and we kind of put it aside. Um, but I, I have a couple questions, a couple comments. One, who requires the citywide traffic study to be done? Uh, the Illinois Vehicle Code. So uh, even as a home rule, we, we have no control over the speed limit of any street? Only to the extent that we've done that engineering study and demonstrated to IDOT that it is uh, reasonably required that the speed limit be changed. Would that, wow. would that be individual streets or as citywide? I, we, if you only wanted to change the speed limit on an individual street, then you would only need to do an engineering study for that, that street. particular okay. street. But you have to do an engineering study on any speed change. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was one of the questions I had. Go ahead, Nick. Uh, no, I, I while, while I'm, I'm glad to hear accidents are down 26%, my, my complaints are up over 26%. <laughs> um, so that's why I, I brought this uh, too. And at the same time, I'm, I'm getting complaints. I drove from Fabian into West Chicago and their city street, the, the sign going into West Chicago says speed limit 25 on all streets unless otherwise posted. Um, so they must have done the study and, and lowered the citywide um, limit, I'm assuming. But 
I only bring that up for one. It, it's the cost. I, it, that study is, is mind boggling to me, but the signage, you don't necessarily have to change every sign. You can do it slowly and you can do it by, as you enter the city, posting signs, obviously, of, of what it is. And, and I'm not necessarily even proposing that. I like I liked your memo because it was uh, it it gave ideas of okay how do we do it if if lowering the limit isn't the solution um, how do we do it um, the uh, nothing is more discomfortable uh, to Abby's point than than having to write a check um, I know we don't have the the police force force to stand on every corner and, and limit checks but. Have we ever looked into, and I don't know what the law is, I know there's speed cameras for school zones. Is that an option? Is that something that a, a municipality can do, or is that a, a state thing, or only limited to Chicago, or, or how does that work? Do you know, Laura? I believe that um, we have the ability to put speed cameras in place where uh, we want them um, and for enforcement measures. Um, you know, I, I guess I would probably reach out to communities that have um, implemented those to see if they had the effect um, that they were looking for. I typically see them on um, traffic signals, uh, on roads with a high rate of speed where people are um, trying to race the red light well the red light cameras are, are one thing and and i don't think we have the ability to do that that's a limited to the chicago and the collar counties um and, and i wouldn't propose that at all but the new thing is the the uh cameras in school zones um so they it, i don't know it's probably not near residential or, or um major intersections and I know it's it's free to municipalities, right? The companies pay to install it, and and you get a percentage of the uh, the tickets. And I I, I would want to look into it. I I don't I I'll look into it more um, to find out more. We can too. I I didn't know if if you have or or anything. I'm just thinking. I see it, and and I know I I don't have the actual solution, but I know. Um. Those, those signs did seem to work. Uh, the school zone, uh, school zone signs, slow down signs that the campaign we did was great. Um, obviously, changing out bump outs and all of that is, is a uh, a good solution, but costly. Mm -hmm. um, if I, I'm just, I, I wanted the conversation. And, and your memo supported it as far as let's let's brainstorm as to what we can do um, and what I, I, I thought lowering the limit was an option only because as, as a human, if I were a police officer, it'd be easier for me to write a ticket for somebody going nine over than it is for somebody going four over. Um, so that's why the limit, the, the sign itself isn't going to probably make changes, but if it can be enforceable. Uh, and people feel the pain, then I think habits get changed. Um, but I don't have the the science or the history to back that, but that's uh, these are the conversations I, I wanted to stoke. And areas where we do uh, have problems, we know that there are areas in our town where whether because of the width of the roadway or other factors like Woodland Hills Road and people turning off of Wilson, um, that people just tend to step on the gas there. And when, when you receive those complaints, even if it is repeat and repeat and repeat, let us know. And because we do find that targeted enforcement does have some effect for some period of time. And, and to support that, I will say this, in, uh, over the last eight years, I, I've put in a couple complaints that targeted areas and uh, the police have been awesome. Either putting in the, the, the temporary radar that shows your, your sign, which 
I know it works for me. I, I slow down because sometimes I'm not conscious of how fast I'm going. Um, but they have uh, put police there. I just, I just know they, we don't have the resources to put them everywhere. So, um, but they've been great and responsive when, when there's specific areas that I get multiple complaints on. Mark? The, the complaint is usually around schools, and I should know this, but I don't drive near schools that often, to be honest. Do, our, do the speed limit signs say, like, a lower speed limit? Ex yes. Like 20. on school, did they all say that? Yeah, mm -hmm. I looked at that today. It was just coming down Main Street. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, if that's there already, we already have the enforcement principle, and I've heard the complaints about it from residents on school days, kids on bikes, people are speeding, and... It just sounds like it needs to be targeted enforcement mm -hmm. and after spring break, after winter break, those types of things when when the kids are, there's more or whatever. I mean, there's the same amount of kids, but it just seems like people forget because they don't see the kids and then they don't, they're not paying attention. I don't know. I, I think it would be interesting to have it citywide. Um, it is kind of astonishing to me that that we would have to do an engineering study. We're not talking about making it faster. We're talking about making it slower. I can see having to do a study that, nope, sorry, that road won't support that speed. That's too high. But going in reverse seems counterintuitive to me, and I just I, I don't understand that. And it, the reason behind it is because of the um, vehicle traffic focus of these regulations, frankly. And what they're saying is we don't want a city to cut down on the flow of traffic unless they can prove that's necessary because they aren't necessarily looking at it. They, they're saying demonstrate that a lower speed is necessary, and that's why they're asking you to say how many pedestrians are present, how many, how many bicyclists are really present, how many cars are parking on the street. They're asking you to justify it being lower because they would prefer to keep traffic flowing faster. Sure, I, I get that ancient thinking. Um, but they're residential areas. I, mm -hmm. you're, you're not going to lower Randall to 25. Right. And 31, 25, Wilson. I mean, Wilson, heck, half of it is, a good portion of it is a lower speed limit. So I just, it, it still baffles me a little bit. And maybe it just needs state code writers to, to mm -hmm. change things a little bit so. I, yeah contacting our officials yeah. Leah. oh i have a couple different things here um one it comes back to the individual streets if we can't change the city as a whole or we don't want to um or because it's a thoroughfare but like i live on a residential street that is still 30 miles per hour like posted on Roberts Lane and it is there's no sidewalks on that street at least on the um, north end of it it's a direct walking route for high school students to get to the high school and it's a bus route for both AGS and the high school and the middle school um, and it's a narrow road because it's I mean part of it, it was um, unincorporated it's mostly incorporated now but like that's an individual street that would definitely benefit from a lower speed limit um because it is very dangerous road mm -hmm. and i see like all sorts of crazy stuff happen on that street regularly but um so i would be like coming back to um how can we get the public more involved with some of these yeah. things I know that this is tricky, so I'm just gonna throw it out there, but don't get mad at me. But like a public survey even, like where people could say problem streets, because not everybody knows to go to their older person to like share their complaints. Like I did not know that when my kids were little and people were coming up and down Roberts Lane at 45 miles per hour, um, that that was an option for me. But so just the survey like for people to indicate where they think problem um, roads are at in their in their town or in their neighborhood, um, and then 
could we do like social media posts, like more of those? We probably did with the yard signs, but, you know, just like some educational um, posts. And um, I don't even know, how can we collaborate more at the high school, like just more education for the students even at the high school? Because um, they're a large part of the issue also. But like a squad car out there we're not using with a big sign on the side of it that says slow down we're watching it's <laughs> a great idea Park it out there. <laughs> i understand that they were very disappointed to hear that we uh acquired a police car with ghost markings on yeah it. they said um, good days are over yeah. we used to like i didn't like that we posted the, that on facebook the pictures <laughs> of what it looked like the white markings they're like now that's eye catching we can see when those guys are yeah. coming but um to your point alderman lehman uh, we were just, uh, Alderman Beck and I were part of um, the kickoff meeting for working with, um, on our um, active, trans blocking. active transportation plan. Active transportation plan. And the company that we have partnered with to do that showed us the project website. And it has an element of it that can be used for crowdsourcing information. And so residents can go, if they were, if there were a similar site for this type of project, people could go on there, tag their street, and mm. say, here's what I see going on. Yeah. Mm. Other people could go to that same street, see what was written there, and say, I agree or I disagree. This is really what's going, mm. you know? And, yeah. and then all of that information can be brought forward. On a map, we'd be able to see where are the city hot spots. So those rise mm -hmm. to the top and become a priority to find out what is the, an, a, a good solution. Is a good solution reducing the speed limit? Is a good solution making the road less comfortable? And we can kind of address those one by one and prioritize them. So I think that- I like that, mm -hmm. I like that idea. Yeah. And then but definitely with the communication and the education and uh, reaching out to our newest drivers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, and the, the one other thing I was gonna say is I do think that the digital speed limit signs, whether it's a smiley face or like slow down or whatever, are very effective because they work for me because sometimes I'm just a distracted driver and exactly. I'm in my own head and I'm just on a straight road and I'm like, oh, the sign, yes, thank you, slow down, you know? So mm -hmm. I think for a lot of people, we're not intentionally driving fast. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's a very straight, wide road and it's easy to drive fast and your brain's somewhere else. So um, It's why the slow down signs work with the kids' yes. face on them yes. because you might be late for getting to an appointment, but you're like, oh yeah, There's that, like, that kid could run out here after a ball right. any second, and that's way more important. Right. So if we could find the hot spots, which I think most of us already know where they're at, but <laughs> um, and then implement some of those signs, I think, I mean, for, I don't want to say a majority, but I think there are a large number of people where that would work significantly. Mm -hmm. Jen? Um, so I, I like some of these ideas that are coming up, but the one thing that always sticks out to me is, you know, as Abby has said, and some of the studies that I've looked at um, while reviewing this is, you know, even reducing, how are we going to patrol that? You know, like, how are we going to actually do that? So as Abby always talks about the bump outs and making the roads smaller um, tonight, I don't know if any of these things that we've suggested would have mitigated the issue that I saw. And it was basically a parent who was upset at their child, yelling and screaming at them in the car and squealing their tires down the damp road. They got to the stop sign, did some erratic driving, and then continued on. And then further up, she had stopped and had her blinkers on and was yelling at the kid. I don't think any of these, any of this would have mitigated that, but I look at Redant Road and go, that is a highway of open space, and is there a way for us to make that a smaller road? And I don't know, because of the emergency vehicles, if there are certain regulations, but I think really taking a serious look as, as we are building, like I'm thinking of the new subdivision as we're building, you know, this may be an area that we target and put in some of these bump outs and test it out and see how that works. When we do reconstruction on our roads, what can we do to make them smaller? Instead of saying, okay, we're going to fill this all in, 
let's make them smaller. Um, let's, you know, let's have greener grass or bigger sidewalks or something or, or give the land back to the people. Let's make our roads smaller and put sidewalks in. And um, because as we know, if, if we have a wide open area, people are just gonna drive crazy. I have it right by my house. And I, it just keeps going back <coughs> this evening. And knowing we were having this conversation, nothing would have stopped that lady from driving the way that she did, unless maybe there were smaller cars. When I have residents talk to me about um, bus in front of my house driving up to the stop sign, we put our cars out, and it does help reduce the speed of people driving. It it you know makes them slow down. It's like oh, there's something in the way. I've got to slow down. I can't be speeding there. Our neighbors up on Pine Street and Redant, people are always wondering why their cars are in the way because they've seen the people blow through that stop sign. Um, so they put their vehicles out there as a measure to calm things. Mm -hmm. But I think as we are designing roads and redoing roads, we need to consider we need to make these smaller. Um, I think Nick oh. may have had his hand Nick, first. go ahead again. Thanks. Now, uh, she just brought up a good point, and, and I had a, just a question on when you have targeted areas, like one area for me, Redance is, is one, but Hart Road, I, I believe the whole thing is county owned, but from Pine to Butterfield, there's not one stop sign. There's not one reason to stop, so people just naturally go faster and faster. Um, Laura, is, is there a is a is that all county and b have we ever had a discussion with them about roads or is there a way to to start a con a discussion to to try to um influence them in, in helping out in that area we talk with um king county about roads all the time you know especially a perfect example would be the intersection of uh, 31 and fabian Parkway is a huge safety issue and between the city talking to them and our residents reaching out directly to them about concerns, um, they have demonstrated, you know, taking, taking action before and um, to the extent that there are areas of Heart Road that are under county jurisdiction, we certainly could raise these issues with them and or, you know, partner with them on um, devising a solution that maybe slows traffic down some. And sections, Do you of know that, sections of that road, Nick, are City of Batavia. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff that has curb and gutter on it. And if you look at it, right, it's, map, it's pretty obvious. There's three, there's like three or four but... different sections in there. I know because I've been over there quite a bit and trying to turn off Bond Drive when there's traffic over there is real interesting as people are going 45 or 50 miles an hour through there. Right. And then they have to lock them up for somebody that wants to cross at the prairie path. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. About yeah, it's crazy. Heart Road is in either Batavia, North Aurora, or Aurora. Okay. And there is just a small portion of it uh, just south of Bailey Drive, where I live on the west side of the street that is Batavia Township. Okay. That's the... I understand it. The road <laughs> jurisdictions out there. It's Aurora. Aurora's got all that air down there by Marmion on okay. both sides of the street. At the Christmas tree fields and all that other good stuff. And North Aurora is there on the west side of, of uh, Hart Road from, they come way into Batavia at about almost up to street now, but it's. Uh, pretty close there, right by the bike trail, is where they they come in to our uh, west side. Of the uh, there's a lot of inter you know inter working there between the three towns. So I you know I don't see any reason why any any of us would have any problems with signs up. Please probably go out there and run radar because I know Bedavia's going out. There yeah. I, people have been stopped and ticketed <laughs> by them. <coughs> Yeah, I think we could look at that, Nick. I think that that's something that could be done out there. I'm sure there's a way to look at that road and figure out where would be, you know, possible places to put stop signs. And again, that would have to be some kind of traffic study to do that and justify putting them at whichever street you wanted to put them at. 
but I think that would give you stop and start points that people would have to pay attention to and not be able to just continually speed if there's nobody out there. Abby? Um, I've written down kind of a list based on a lot of comments, so sorry this is like going to ping pong around a little bit, but um, the mayor was talking yesterday about the police reports that we can review every day, and I don't know if anybody else noticed in 2020, and we can see it in <coughs> Laura's memo too, that people stopped driving and all of a sudden the rates of property damage only reports went way down. I mean, we're at over a crash a day in normal years, so I'm kind of glad that it's still maintaining kind of low there, but um, the work group that you mentioned in your memo too, Laura, is that to address the traffic calming measures or to address a speed limit adjustment or both? You know, um, and the next topic that we're going to discuss is our strategic action plan and some types of, um, you know, changes that we might make to it about what makes sense. And it seems to me that um, in light of the conversation that's been brought forward, maybe it is looking at um, uh, areas where there it seems to be a traffic speed issue. That's the project. Mm -hmm. And then to say, what is the appropriate solution without saying, maybe it's not always traffic calming. Maybe it's enhanced enforcement. Maybe it's education. You know, you know, kind of first identifying the problems and then trying to come up with the most appropriate solution. Okay. Um, the uh, if anybody wants to see what Laura was talking about too, if you Google Wiki Mapping for Walk Bike Lyle, and you can like go through all of their problem areas and see their map. It's really fascinating. And then the. Uh, from the education perspective, they have required now biking and walking education materials to start uh, in third grade going all the way through driver's ed in high school too. So they are getting more instructions on how to interact on the road with all modes of transportation, which is great. Um, and- Abby, is that in Batavia? Yeah, yeah. So it started right before I worked with the bike commission and um, then assistant principal Milka at Hoover Wood to put together the curriculum for them. And, and then, so that was 2018, I think, maybe, that we, that it was started, that it became state law that we have to do it. Yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, to the traffic calming budget item, which I think is fantastic. You know, when we identify these problem areas, I think Redant would be a great one. There are some wonderful resources out there for temporary tests and test interventions that we can see if they make a difference and if they improve driver behavior and, and public safety in general that are all approvable by the MUTCD and et cetera, et cetera, but um, that wouldn't cost a lot, that wouldn't be permanent, that if they didn't work, we didn't like them, then we could just try them somewhere else or try something else. So I think that would be a really great thing to work with that budget on is identifying these project areas and just trying something. Like let's not wait a couple of years for a couple more crashes per day, uh, let's just try something and make it safer now, and then regroup, study, uh, you know, evaluate it, try something else. And, but I'm really glad Nick brought this up because I'm really glad we're just at least gonna do something. Because yeah, I think there are a whole lot of places around town that have those issues, mm -hmm. you know, at different times of day, you know, different days of the week where different streets are racetracks. And you know you can sit outside on your patio and just about anywhere in town and listen, and you can hear it. You know at different times, whether it's motorcycles or little noisy cars or big noisy cars or trucks or whatever, you can hear the noise of people speeding throughout town. So I think it's something we're all really aware of, and now we have to figure out how to do something about it. So I think you're right. Whatever steps we can take, especially if it's something we try and don't like. It wouldn't be something concrete that we'd have to rip out and start right. over again. Right. Leah? Um, so, actually, I actually have a question for you, Abby. Part of getting the public involved, is there ways that like residents can do things, kind of like you were saying with parking the car on the street, um, but that help encourage a street to, for people to slow down? So 
you know, a nice little planter by your mailbox. I don't know. But like, are there suggestions like that out there where residents can take some of this ownership also and do stuff along their property line that just help give the appearance of let's slow down, you know? Yes, absolutely. And I won't rattle anything off right now, but I'll share kind of the resources that I've uh, <coughs> gathered over the years. Um, and what's great, like a lot of them too fall into this kind of like tactical urbanism where it's it's bigger cities that are, you know, the residents are actually going out and painting a traffic circle. You know, they're they're doing those that level of thing because their city's not doing it. Mm -hmm. And I I'm glad that we're doing it. <laughs> you know, like it's not the bottom up necessarily, but um I'm not I'm not suggesting that people go out and paint traffic circles in their streets tonight, but like Why? It but, like a great <laughs> <I know. laughs> but if somebody wanted a public art well, project, I think we would we an should support it. Drying, uh, garage paint and go out Right, slow down. Exactly, down exactly. So, um, yes, and I will share, I will share articles, ideas, and all the resources that have been put out there. But for I sure. did see like some of the stuff where it was painting, like, mm -hmm. and I thought about that even along Wilson Street to where the pedestrians cross. Like, let's paint the road there so people realize this is a place where people need to cross. Mm -hmm. Like, instead of having the sign of cross. Let's let's paint the road and make it stick out like people are going to be crossing. Yep. And I saw some of that and I was like, oh, I'd love to bring that because that is such a problem along Wilson Street. Mm -hmm. and, and what you're going to hear the um, unfun but um, adhering to regulatory <laughs> requirements uh, say is that a crosswalk has specific markings that are identified in the MUTCD. And I know that you see different colored crosswalks in other cities, but they're taking on the liability. Remember, the two people who use the MUTCD, civil engineers and lawyers. Right. And so if we're willing to accept liability associated with um, artistic crosswalks that are eye-catching, <laughs> but are not the standard marking for crosswalks. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is similar to public parking signs so that people recognize it as such. But right now it's only a sign in the street that right. people are crossing. So well, I think if we use that element and enhance it with the street paint. And the way around it is that you don't paint the crosswalk, you paint around the crosswalk. You paint, right. you paint the bump out instead of actually putting a curb to make a bump out, you paint the corner yeah. tighter so that cars have that. It's just perceived that they have to go slower around this painted area. Paint. Or you paint in the center of the road and you do a circle in the middle that kind of creates a roundabout type thing. So there has yes, to be a way to paint. incorporate yep. the legal exactly. and mm -hmm. yep. what you see. And I think that's what we need to investigate because that is a pretty inexpensive. And I think I've shared it, I think uh, on some webinar somewhere, but um, there are cities out there that have, I think Colorado is one of them. It's like a mural roadway, mural intersection, mural uh, like approval process for neighborhoods to just go and do it themselves. And here's the form you fill out, just like a normal permit to do a block party. And then you get to have a little community activated space. Super neat. Hey, Laura. Yes. I, I noticed uh, the, the Chief's online. Uh, Chief, would you have any input into this? Is this, uh, are we just beating our heads against a, a, a dead end? Or uh, do you see, do you see a problem? And do you see any uh, solutions? Well, I definitely don't think you're beating your heads against a wall. Uh, clearly, these are issues and they're cyclic issues. Uh, with the seasons changing, with the uh, school uh, sessions going in and out, uh, we have these problems periodically. And when we do try to address them uh, through targeted enforcement and routine patrolling, uh, high visibility uh, presence in those areas, uh, really uh, our greater complaint in these school uh, zone areas is really traffic congestion, volume versus speed. I'm not saying we don't get speeding complaints in the, in the school zones, but we really traffic congestion, parking issues, those are the things we focus on. And we spent a lot of time uh, in the school zone areas at the uh, beginning of the shifts and our beginning of the uh, school day and the end of the school day, uh, trying to mitigate those issues. We've uh, worked uh, continuously with the school district, uh, increasing signage, increasing 
uh, officer presence in those areas uh, to uh, reduce congestion and traffic volumes. Um, and uh, all the school zones are, are properly marked right now in the uh, current uh, vehicle code regulation or uh, between the hours of 7 a.m. and 4 p.m. The uh, school speed limit is 20 miles per hour when school children are present. So uh, all of our school zones are properly marked in that regard. Uh, in addition to targeted enforcement, we do have uh, three speed signs, two of our portable. Uh, one that we uh, purchased was uh, solar that was we plan on putting up on Batavia Avenue um, in the area of uh, North, uh, North Avenue because we have a lot of speeding complaints about in that area. We had some problems with uh, IDOT regarding the uh, permanent installation of a, of a tra traffic speed sign there. So we're still, still trying to uh, find some landing spots for that. Really, we're, we're targeting Hart Road in the, uh, in the bike path crossing area. So we do have a lot of speeding complaints there. We do, we do have uh, primary jurisdiction on Hart Road between Pine Street uh, and Wind Energy Pass. And then it passes on to North Aurora and Aurora in several different areas between there and Butterfield Road. Uh, but we do a lot of enforcement activity out there. But uh, the reality is we have the officers we have, and uh, there are over 110 miles of roadway in the city of Batavia, and, and the overwhelming majority of them are residential in nature. So uh, we, we can only be in so many places at so many times. So it is very helpful when you do get these speeding complaints from, from your area residents and your constituents that you pass them along to us, and we will do uh, we do traffic watches. We do uh, we will install the speed signs. They uh, we can install them so they uh, are visibly display display speeds. We also can install them so uh, they're set up in blackout mode so we can collect data uh, because oftentimes uh, in in those situations uh, the perception is that the speeding is high, but the reality is that uh, the speed sign doesn't uh, doesn't flush that out um, uh, as uh, Laura. Uh, Succinctly indicated, the uh, traffic crash totals, not that there's a direct correlation, but uh, crash totals have gone down 26% in the last three years. So 2019 was the, the last pre-pandemic year, uh, and the last two years, we think, are kind of anomalous. But uh, the reality is there are fewer cars out there on the roadway than there were two years ago, uh, and it's reflected in the crash totals. Uh, and in, in, in concert with that, there are more people at home. Uh, more people are working from home, so there are more eyes watching in the re residential neighborhoods. So uh, that may be why you're having a precipitous increase in the in the complaints from your constituents that there's more people at home to see these things. And previously, before the pandemic, they may have been off during the daytime at work. I'm not saying it's not an issue, but that may explain to some extent the increase in the volume. Uh, certain areas we know that are uh, perennial issues: Woodland Hills, Redant Road, the larger roads. Uh, Woodland Hills, obviously being so close to Kirk Road, it's a cut through. So a lot of um, uh, a lot of vehicles use it uh, because of the traffic volume and, and uh, congestion on Kirk Road during the peak hours. Uh, so we do have speeding complaints there. We have uh, residents that regularly contact us when the volume uh, and the, the speeds get too high, and we will do periodic enforcement. Uh, but uh, you know that requires uh, periodic hygiene as well, maintenance as well, because it, it only lasts so long. We spend uh, do targeted for enforcement campaigns uh, in these neighborhoods. Uh, it has an impact for a while, then we go away and it dissipates and we have to come back at a later time. Uh, the same thing applies to our speed signs as well. Uh, so those may be areas where geometric changes uh, like traffic circles, traffic circles might be a, uh, an effective countermeasure on a place like, on a road like Woodland Hills, uh, residential, but it's that are long thoroughfares uh, that, that's a, kind of a long straight street all the way down to Pine Street. So uh, there's a lot of traffic that circumvents Kirk Road on that. Um, but I agree, a, a combination of uh, ge geometric changes as well as enforcement strategies. Uh, like I said, we only have two boxes that the traffic signs right now. We could probably uh, put more in the budget in the future, uh, but uh, they, they do require uh, upkeep. Uh, they are battery operated, so the batteries have to be replenished uh, basically annually, and they're fairly expensive. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have any comments? Anybody online? Abby, what was that work group again for Laura that you talked about? It, Wiki. Oh, the um, it's Wiki mapping and like search Lyle Walk Bike Lyle Wiki Wiki mapping Walk Wiki Bike map. Lyle. Wiki mapping dot com slash Lyle dash bicycle dash and dash pedestrian dash plan is the full URL. OK. 
Okay, well, I'm glad we had a good discussion on this because I think there are some ideas that have come up, and I think along with what we're going to talk about next, I think that that's something that we just have to sure. keep moving forward on to try to come up with some solutions for some of the bad spots in town and try different things. I mean, I think that that's really what we have to do. I don't know that even if every one of us writes letters to everybody that is downstate that might have something to do with this, I doubt that that's going to happen within the next decade that they decide to change their minds. You know, IDOT's, I mean, we've argued with them on so many different things, I can't, don't know where to start. Um, probably the biggest is the crosswalk issue. I mean, and I still don't understand why we can't just go out and paint a crosswalk if we want one out there and they won't let us because they don't allow crosswalks on a four-lane four street unless it happens to be a state road in Geneva or Sycamore or any other one of a number of ones that are around here. So that's my two cents on that. So if there's nothing else, I think we're kind of done with this. And mm -hmm. But we'll expect to see with... that working group formed, um, you know, to, to be up and running in 2022. And then when, as we go through the budget, then we can try, once that mm -hmm. group's up, we can try and identify what we want to spend that money on mm -hmm. and where we want to, you know, try to make the most improvement we can. But I would say definitely when you get complaints, pass them on to the police department. Every time I've had them in my ward or different spots and said something, they're out there, they make a difference in it. And people that have asked or informed me of those issues are very appreciative when they do see that happen mm -hmm. and most of the time you do see it change in the speeds on those roads okay um, then next we will move on to a discussion of the quarterly report on the annual review of the strategic action plan Laura? yeah so around this time every year we'd like to um, not only go over the third quarter activities that have happened with regard to the strategic action plan but to take an our annual look at that plan and because it's uh coming right before we head into our discussions regarding the budget and some of the things that we decide here um, may affect that plan So just to go over, um, we had some uh, objectives which were related to economic vitality. I think um, the, the first one is titled hire a business development manager. Since that has been accomplished, I think maybe I would change that title um, in the future to uh, the development of a strategic plan for economic development because that was really the first major uh, thing that we wanted our business development manager to tackle. Um, the second is the uh, to actively market Batavia to new businesses. And um, Shannon has certainly made a, a great start at that. But going forward, would like to see her partner with um, Griffin Price. So um, Shannon comes into the position with a lot of ideas that she has uh, from her 15 years in economic development um, and to, to kind of partner that with Griffin's expertise in um, getting messages out in, uh, to the people who they need to get out in front of and in a way that is um, attractive. So we want to um, have them form a team to accomplish uh, this objective. They be, they'll be our primary team. And then also working in conjunction with our uh, community partners such as Main Street and uh, also um, the Chamber of Commerce. The third is promoting opportunities for downtown re redevelopment, working to cultivate and facilitate additional projects that are like One Washington Place, and finally to continue to implement aspects of the streetscape plan. And so in quarter three, um, Shannon has continued to meet with stakeholder groups and um, she is drafting a survey to institutionalize um, the outreach for business retention purposes and baseline programming and she'll incorporate all of that into uh, draft economic uh, development strategic plan. And she's also uh, continuing to 
monitor uh, funding opportunities and related legislation to assist our businesses in um, taking advantage of grants that might be available um, and also legislation that affects them either positively or negatively and making sure to uh, get the word out about those things. Marketing Batavia, um, we had an RFP that was led uh, in early fall and we were looking for a company to uh, assist us with marketing several city-owned properties for future development. Um, and we're continuing to work with Intersect Illinois, which is, uh, has been hired by the Office of Economic and uh, Opportunity and Development. Um, and they send us, you know, um, kind of blind um, uh, opportunities, you know, not naming the company that is looking, but what are the uh, different elements that they're looking for. There are some that we have ended up um, having further meetings with and are still working with, and we hope that um, we might have some real opportunities that come from that. But the other thing that Shannon has done, and you may have seen it in a recent issue of Neighbors, is to, to try to uh, put a face on the Batavia business community. She did a nice article on the different stores that we have in town that sell books. And um, she's going to look to do a series of those types of articles that identify the small businesses in our town and why they're special and, and encourage our residents to continue to support our small businesses. And then promoting downtown development. Um, as you know, we approved the amendment to the RDA which provides a revised timeline for the One Washington Place project, and staff and the developer have uh, met for several hours over the last month and a half to uh, talk about safety codes and other building code requirements, and also a contingent of um, elected officials and staff went to uh, visit the Oswego property in order to tour that and get an idea about some things that uh, will be have relevance to our own local project. Um, and then on the streetscape, I think that we will probably um, next look at the area of um, Prairie Street that, and the surrounding con constituents in that area to get their input um, so that when we are ready to do that phase two project over on, on Prairie Street, that we incorporate elements of the um, streetscape plan that we would like to see incorporated into that project. And uh, the next area of our strategic plan are transportation objectives. And we are continuing to pursue implementation of the uh, road diet on Illinois Route 31. We know that this is going to um, be a, a battle <laughs> to get something like this approved with IDOT. They have not been favorable toward road diets in the past. Um, I think that they, um, in essence, conducted a, a bit of an experiment by approving a very small section of road for a road diet in Geneva. And, um, but the, I think overall, the experience with that has been positive. And so I think that that works in our favor. Also, the CMAP on to 2050 plan um, includes a, uh, a transportation report, and one of the recommendations of that report was to implement a road diet all the way from Fabian Parkway down through North Aurora. And so I think that's another element that, that helps us justify um, to IDOT and, and then what we're doing this fall is we are going to conduct the traffic study that is uh, the, the initial element of it. And we're happy that IDOT encouraged us to do that traffic study because I think they easily could have said during COVID times, you're not really getting a real picture of what those traffic levels are, but we're happy that they are willing to allow us to do that and then to move on to um, justifying the need for a road diet there. And finally, collaborating with uh, the Batavia Bicycle Commission on development of an active transportation plan. We had our uh, kickoff meeting today, which was really great. So quarter three on the road diet, um, we've selected a contractor to perform the engineering study for the project and that will be performed in the fourth quarter of 2021. And uh, with regard to sharrows and bike lanes, 
um, City Council reviewed the Bicycle Commission's suggestion for new signage, and um, there was a commitment to adopt that new signage when IDOT um, formally approves that and, and makes it a, an approved sign that can be used even on their streets and local streets. And then also um, staff met with the uh, KDOT um, to suggest a joint project for the Randall Main Street uh, intersection, which would be a pedestrian and bicycle crossing, either a tunnel or a flyover. And they felt that um, that project might really have legs because it was really um, successful up north in, in South Elgin. Um, they decided to go over the road but um, in a less expensive uh, way might be to have a tunnel under and the grades that are present at the Randall and Main Street intersection may offer the opportunity to do the tunnel under the road that would be much easier. So we'll continue our uh, discussions on that and hope to incorporate that as part of the, um, the, the phase two of the Main Street reconstruction project from uh, Van Norwick out to Randall Road. And then, um, of course, the, the kickoff meeting, I've already discussed that. Next are our infrastructure objectives, and the first two elements of that were a couple of um, very important discussions, and we had those over the course of the last quarter to uh, develop an infrastructure funding policy and in conjunction of that to discuss uh, and review the service level expectations. Uh, where we came out there, I think, is that long term we want to maintain the um, service levels that we uh, currently have um, with the understanding that um, that means that we are going to um, either have to we can utilize our ARPA funds for um, some of the projects that we want to do, but that we are probably, some element of that is going to have to be the issuance of bonds for future improvements. And Gary Holm did a tremendous job of um, laying all of that out in a timeline, spreadsheet, and identifying funding sources, which is being used as a template for how we will um, propose those items in, in uh, this budget and in future budgets. So I think that was a very fruitful um, conversation. But I think that means that there's the possibility of maybe eliminating these as uh, strategic action plan items, um, but knowing full well that it will be a policy of ours going into the future that as we identify um, major projects, that at the same time we identify those major projects, we identify funding sources. And so a perfect example would be as we um, decide upon a particular alternative concept for the dam removal and preservation or what, what the depot pond is gonna look like thereafter, right then and there we need to decide how are we going to uh, fund that project so that we can put that plan in place and we make sure that um, our plans happen on the timeline that has been established for implementation. And so that leaves the third infrastructure objective, which is to enhance the safety of bikers and walkers in our neighborhoods. And so that's a what we've been discussing here um, this evening. Uh, and I think that the enhance the safety of bikers and walkers in our neighborhood um, may also really relate to our active transportation plan. Um, so I kind of like to maybe propose that we collapse this infrastructure objectives, that it's perhaps infrastructure and transportation objectives and I find a way to weave the um, objectives of 3.3 into um, the active transportation plan objective to try to find a way to make all of that work together, if that sounds okay, but you can give me feedback on that. Um, so what we did in quarter three was that we had those two committee of the whole discussions and, and came up with um, 
uh, a way to fund uh, years one through five in the 2022 budget and uh, 2022 through 2026. Um, and then the service level expect, uh, expectations remain the same and um, traffic calming, uh, just to mention that we did add funding um, in, is included in 22 budget as well as for the four years thereafter. The next are our river objectives. Um, number one being create a master plan for the development of our riverfront. The first elements of that are the discussions that we're having surrounding the removal of the dam and the effect on Depot Pond. Uh, actively marketing the riverfront uh, development activities and identifying inexpensive ways to capitalize on having a river that is in the heart of our downtown. And in quarter three, the Park Board and Council met on August 3rd. We decided to put all five concepts for dam removal forward. We had both a virtual public engagement meeting as well as an in-person. Um, and then and now that we've collected the uh, preferences, we are working towards having a joint meeting with the um, park board in order to um, settle on uh, the, the concept that we wish to move forward with in the future. Um, as far as marketing the riverfront developments, um, that is something that the economic development manager will certainly have as part of the uh, strategic plan that is being developed. And then river engagement um, activities. The Batavia Environmental Commission hosted a river cleanup event on September 18th, and we had several volunteers from the community and other um, organizations within the community who came out to uh, help with that event. I think another river engagement activity that we have is the um, the park district is working with the Rotary Club wanted to donate a large Adirondack chair that um, I think that is going to be put out here on the South Plaza toward the river side. And the way that this fit, fits in is that um, it, it was a donation, but it offers sort of an Instagrammable opportunity and um, a way that people hopefully will be posting those images on social media and showing the, uh, the beauty of our downtown and the way that the river enhances that. So, And then the, the uh, fifth element of our strategic plan is uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in quarter three, we, uh, I met with Wendy Bednarik and we have a plan for um, recruiting an equity and inclusion employee committee. So kind of going to start this project with our own house and um, look at our own organization and develop a plan for our own organization. Um, also wanted to mention, you know, very proud that Michelle Langston has, was promoted to be the first um, a female uh, member of our command staff here in the um, Batavia Police Department. So that was certainly a, a really proud moment for us um, here in Batavia. And with that, uh, I'd ask if anybody has any questions or if you have any comments about ways that I was talking about amending the plan or other things that you would like to see. One of the elements that I think that we certainly could consider adding here in light of the fact that um, we were discussing um, putting into the budget money for um, an AmeriCorps intern um, to assist, and that would be in collaboration with the other uh, members of the Tri-Cities to develop a sustainability plan framework that each of us could adopt for uh, our own. I think maybe that would be a, a good thing to add to our strategic plan, to have that environmental sustainability element to it. Um, I'd also like to propose again that we go through the climate action plan that we signed um, and integrate, go through that you know bit by bit so that we understand what we signed and then um, integrate what we can into a, a, a whole sustainability section, like we're saying, of our strategic plan so that we're keeping track of those things that we're doing. Yeah, I think that that's very important when we do say we're gonna do 
some of those things where we sign onto a plan like that, we look at the things that we think we can achieve, set that up, and then measure ourselves against that so that we do keep track of the things mm -hmm. we're signing on to do and to move forward mm -hmm. with. Because I think it's important. I mean, I thought about that, again, looking at things that are happening around us and why or what does, is it going to take for us to start to um, either shrink or electrify some of our um, city vehicles that just get run around for things that they don't need to sit and idle all day for when they're, they're out on a job site or, you know, checking different things. If there's a way we can have a vehicle that does not consume any fossil fuels while they're doing that, I think that's great. I have no problem with the thing sitting there and being plugged in all night to charge it. Um, you know, I, I think that that's something we really have to think about. You know, we went through, I don't know how many years ago it was, where we talked about a no idle policy and changing the biodiesel and the trucks that we have, have to run on diesel. I get that, but I think there's other steps we could take, and that's part of what I think mm -hmm. we need to really identify and then figure out how we get there. Mm -hmm. So I just have a question. Do we have other plans that we've signed besides this client action plan that that we've talked about? The Greenest Region Compact. Yes. I, for it. The, I think there's two that we've signed on to in the last four years. Only one that I know of. Well, the greenest. In the last two well, years. In the past. So two region years ago, we did Greenest Region. That was 2018. I wasn't on city council yet. And then, because yeah. some of what I would like to see is with these different plans that we've done, how do they fit into our strategic action plan? I almost would like to see like another column that says this addresses this plan so we can actually see it and we can say, hey, we've signed this and this mm -hmm. addresses that. As a matter of fact, we just did that. So um, both Gary Holm and Scott Buning, I asked them to take the Greenest Region Compact and identify, go line by line through the Greenest Region Compact and identify what things that we are already doing that um, are, are part of that plan. I think that um, what, what I was suggesting was Make that another one of the elements of this plan at, in terms of environment and sustainability, and we would do there, our are there audit. There elements in here that we're already doing that address some of those things. Oh, that's what I'm saying. So the yeah. audit, the audit says these are the things that we're doing that are already in there. So, for instance, um, I would expect that the fact that we have implemented the you know top of the line phosphorus removal equipment in our wastewater treatment plant is an element that would be uh, address something that is in the greenest region compact there are there are numerous things that that we do already that are um, objectives in the greenest region compact we just haven't said gone through and done our audit to say these things we're doing these things we're doing, but they're not fully implemented, and these things we're not doing. So that then we can go back and say, of the things that we're not doing, what could we do? So that we're working toward moving those check boxes to the left of having um, implemented them in some way. Yeah, because I think, you know, we always talk about all these plans, like, we're going to do this, but we don't see it. And, and to kind of go along with Alderman, Miller, what he's always asked about of what is our plan? What are we what are we working toward? What are we This is what we're working toward. This this right, big plan here. So if we put it on there, then we'll do it. Right. But there's some, you know, some other things. Like when we talk about the river, the riverfront development. Yes, we, we're talking about one aspect of it, but why are we not creating like a plan up and down where we have a session where we say what would you like to see along the east and west of banks of our river? Mm -hmm. You know, a sidewalk connecting the river trail. And then, you know, somebody says, oh, well, I want to see three benches along the way. So we throw in three benches and somebody says, oh, I'd like to see a waterfall in the middle of it. Crazy things, but at least it's something we can look at. And then when we go and do the budget, we can sit there and go, okay, you know, 
are there some of these things that are part of this development that we can add year after year to help develop that along the way? Because this is going to be a long term, mm -hmm. Riverfront's going to be long term. But then also, are we hitting elements of some of these plans that we have signed on on to? Mm -hmm. Like some of the materials, are we doing green materials? Is, is there an opportunity? And it may cost more money, but if this is what we've signed on, we need to be able to plan for it and to budget for it. Absolutely. And so I think, you know, I know that in the past, somebody has said that hasn't worked. And right now as a council, we may say, this is what we're thinking right now. And years down the road, it may change, but at least it gives future future councils, something to look at and work towards, like, hey, they put this plan together. We, this was something that was important. We knew this was a long-term plan. And they may change elements of it because maybe we get some funding that, you know, pays for it and we can implement it at that time. But I think right now, if we don't have something in place to visually look at or to think of, we can't really think of those opportunities for grants that are out there. And I think that's something that would really help. And I know that Alderman Miller has been asking for that many, many times, many, many months, if I'm not correct. So what the city has is a comprehensive plan. It also has a downtown plan, and it also has a streetscape plan that identifies block by block of the downtown exactly what the plan is. That plan was done a long time ago. Um, and maybe it may be that we want to redo that. It. So would, would you like to see? And incorporate that into a long-term river development along the way. So what I was going to say was, would you like an update of those plans to be included in the 2022 budget? Typically, a, a complete redo of your comprehensive plan is something that costs about $150,000. It's, it's so you know, all-encompassing and looking at every single area of the community, or would you like to have a plan that is focused on specific areas? Uh, Abby, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, when we first got on council, we kind of got together and looked at the old streetscape plan we were talking about knocking off low-hanging fruit so we probably need to readdress what's in that yeah and what are the things we could knock off every year because a lot of those things don't need to change we just need to start doing them yeah we had the down we reviewed the downtown plan and the streetscape plan and mm -hmm. formed a committee to start talking about those and then due to lack of bandwidth somebody dropped the ball and hasn't scheduled a meeting in a couple months. So, and we've had some turnover of people on the committee too. So yes, we should get that back together. And Mike O'Brien used to be the other mm -hmm. city council liaison uh, that was on that. So more yeah, yeah. people are welcome to join. And we I got all this stuff. Okay. He yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Sitting in a seat. So that seems like a good idea. We can get that band back together and start talking about it. That would be really great actually. Because as we're going into budgets, these are things that we need to consider. Like, are these part of the plans that press or past councils have already worked on? Mm -hmm. We, you know, it may not be what our dream is, and are there some things that maybe that need to change just with how things are? But we have to continue to move that forward. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah, and I think that there are things that are in those agreements that we signed to that we're doing or that we've been working on and we're not identifying those as part of that. I mean, one of the things with working to try to get safer routes to school and to get people pedestrian uh, active to get to schools, that also helps reduce the traffic around the schools, which we heard from Chief is a big problem. We all know that that's a problem, especially around the grade schools, that, you know, those type of things, again, are beneficial to any kind of environmental plan you have or any kind of, you know, green action plan that you want to implement. So we have to think about, okay, it fits in this box, but it also fits in that mm -hmm. one. And to make sure that we identify those and keep working harder on those things because the benefits from that one side of it create other benefits. 
-hmm. And I think we, we need to make sure that we think about those as we're doing that to try to get all those boxes checked off. And a plan like this helps with accountability because I'm going to be sitting here every three months saying, you know, how, how do we move the piece closer to accomplishing the goal? So that's why whatever it is, we should make it um, part of this plan. And I like adding the sustainability plan and climate. I think that's a very important part that we really need to have focus mm -hmm. on and address. Will do. Does anybody online have any comments or questions? Make sure they're all still awake there. <laughs> Can't tell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's Sarah. Okay. She's awake. We got a wave. Got a thumbs up. Okay. We're all good there. We're here. Okay. How about everybody in the room? Are you guys all okay with where we're at and where we're going with this? I think it is good. Because I think this does bring up things like, you know, they'd be trying to get the, that group together to go yes. back on the downtown stuff. Some of us probably forgot about that because some of the people that were part of that are gone. Mm -hmm. So you kind of lose the focus on that. And that's why it is very good to review these things and, again, hold ourselves accountable when we say we're going to do some of this stuff, that we keep focused on it and we keep going back to it and trying to get as much of it done as we can. So I'm glad... That's where we're at. Mm -hmm. Leah? So is it part of the comprehensive plan? I'm so new, I'm so new to all this. Like, as the downtown area continues to grow and as we add new buildings, like the Shodin building, I mean, we saw the McDonald's and the Walgreens, like, that they came in with, um, I think listening to what Batavia wanted and kind of blending in with our downtown area. And I know Shodine listened some and they added limestone to the building. Like, is that what we're just requesting each time we have a building project or is that part of our comprehensive strategic plan? It's interesting that you bring that up and I'll defer to Alan because you were here when those discussions were had. I believe if you look at the comprehensive plan, they would have preferred for the building to come right up to the street site. front mm -hmm. to street be a street front, front building yeah. and that was probably the biggest was, argument yeah. that we had both with mcdonald's well mcdonald's really wasn't a, a big argument because they just came in and they knew what envelopes that they could build in and they built mm -hmm. where walgreens we really wanted them up against the street and we really went back and forth and back and forth to try to make that happen and I think there was like 19 different drawings of that building. And their big thing was, is their corporate standard, and they will not deviate, deviate from it. They just don't want to change it. Mm -hmm. They have to have so many parking spaces within sight or feed it from the door, oh. the entrance to the building, and they just don't want to change that. Yeah. And you look at other stores that have been done in different spots, you know, local around here, and even though they look different or they may be a street front, they still have those many, that many parking spaces within that area from the front door. It's just bizarre, but that's what they say works for them. And I mean, I, I guess it's hard to argue with their, you know, their own yeah. marketing and their own numbers. They know what they're doing because so they're always successful. Other future development, whether it's residential or other um, even privately owned buildings already in Batavia that might do updates in the future do we have any type of code or anything for them to that they need to follow so that we have um, a downtown that looks unified and absolutely okay. that was the whole reason for historic preservation okay. commission um, what happened was a couple of the downtown um, uh, older buildings you know uh, got destroyed mm -hmm. and i think the the city took a little bit of a gasp and said well you know what we don't want to be overbearing mm -hmm. on what we require when people uh, redevelop or adaptive reuse mm -hmm. um, an existing building in our downtown but we want to make sure that everything still fits together and that people aren't coming up with the uh, too wacky of an element that looks out of place and so that's where historic preservation commission 
really, that's their role. And does that include every building in downtown Batavia or just historic buildings? The, all of the downtown is in the historic district. Okay. And so any building within the historic district okay. must uh, go through the historic preservation commission approval process. And they get, they get ranked from yes. non-contributing, I think, mm -hmm. is at one end, to contributing or her, I, I don't remember the exact layout of them. So if a but, strip mall is going to like paint, does that go through the historic? It does. Okay. I mean, I, I don't know if, <laughs> if, if they repainted exactly how it was painted before, okay. maybe not, but if they're gonna be changing any of it, okay. the facade elements. Okay. Yeah. And they and they fall under the non-contributing, so the the width of what they can do is bigger Broader. than a building that's you know 150 years old and had you know really ornate stonework mm -hmm. and everything. The, the requirements are different for that building than they are on something that's 20 years old mm -hmm. and gets a facelift. So the, they fall under two different things, but they still have to go through historic preservation because they're within the district. Mm -hmm. You wanted to say something, yeah. Your Honor? Will you grab a mic? So that way we get this on here. Thank the you. Uh, one thing I want to just kind of do a little her history clarity here. Uh, McDonald's was in downtown Batavia before any of us, including myself, was on the city council. There was a first version of that building that was there, and that was torn down, I don't know, 10 years ago now maybe. Uh, I will tell you that in the first time they did it, I was a newspaper reporter. The second time they did it, I was the mayor. In both times, there was discussion on the city council. There were several aldermen that didn't like the drive through window. And, you know, the second time, McDonald's told me, that's a non-starter. If we don't have a drive through window, we aren't going to be here. McDonald's now tells me that over 70% of their daily business goes through that drive through window. So that's, that's very important to them. And, you know, I think in the, in the modern thinking that we deal with as retailers, and I'll use... Uh, Panera, as a good example, they left downtown Batavia, and apparently the only reason they wanted to leave, they'd like to find another place to come back, as far as I can tell, is they need a drive through window. And they, we even had some exercises over there in the alley behind about trying to, but if you brought them in off of First Street, then when the car got to the back of the building, it was on the passenger side, the window, so they didn't like that. Then we even went out into Water Street and tried to maybe have some kind of a holding lane, and their attorney did not like that because he says you're putting this in a public street and then we're going to be potentially liable for something that we're doing out in the public street, so we're not going to buy into that one too. So, I mean, there's a lot of come see, come sign, all this conversation about stuff. Uh, when the library came, they wanted to build a new library. One of the items that was a little bit of debate on is they wanted to have, quote, unquote, a drive-through window at the back of the building. And they were kind of, they weren't sure themselves what they were going to do with it. Now it's turned basically into just dropping off your books that you've checked out and you don't have to go in the building. At one point, I think there was some conversation that maybe you could call and order something and maybe you still can and they would bring it out or hand it to you through the window. So drive through windows are becoming more and more of a, of a necessity, I would tell you, and I would think anything we're going to do here is probably going to have to have some conversation about how the drive through window will or will not work. Uh, of course, the one thing that, that is not allowed is you can't drive through window alcohol, and so uh, you got to get out of the car and come in and get that, and I think that's a strong policy to have because I could see people trying to and beers through the window to somebody driving a car and all kinds of stuff like that. So uh, that's where that's all sitting at right at the moment. Mark? Um, the one thing that we, we've we asked about and just kind of popped into my head as Leah was talking is um, form-based code. And Scott was looking into it and just didn't have time, but I would really like to address that again because that's what can dictate what every new building looks like when it's when it's built and then you don't really care about what's in it you just care about what it looks like so and that's a high level way to look at it so I, but i know we've we talked about that a year and a half or more ago so i would like to bring that back up that we should really explore that for our downtown area okay thanks everybody for good input and yeah. good discussion tonight
And now we'll move on to item seven, which is project status. I don't really have anything new to share except, you know, the wonderful kickoff meeting that we had um, for our active transportation um, plan. The next steps in that process will be to um, put together a steering committee that would be larger than um, the group of us that met today. The purpose of the steering uh, committee is to um, have members from large constituencies from within um, our community so that we make sure that um, a multitude of perspectives are heard from. Also, Active Transportation Alliance did a very convincing job of um, demonstrating the ways that they are going to do community outreach in a way like I don't think we've ever seen on, on other projects, you know, with the crowdsourcing. They also talked about um, uh, being present at numerous events where many of our, in our community are gathered in order to, um, uh, what is it called, drop in? Stumble upon, stumble, stumble upon, upon events. stumble upon events where you're just like, oh, somebody's asking me about walking and biking in our community. And so uh, looking forward to uh, that aspect of it. And the steering committee will be there um, both uh, to provide input on the process and the perspectives about bicycling and, and walking in our community, but then um, once recommendations are developed to come back again and um, evaluate those recommendations that have been formulated to try to make sure that um, they are best addressing um, the needs of our community. And then finally, um, active transportation will, will put all of that hard work into uh, a plan to be delivered and, and recommended to you for approval and it's expected that that whole process will probably take the better part of a year and i'm glad that they're taking you know a nice measured approach to it to make sure that they get it right our last plan was from 2007 and so um has uh i i really don't know that it, it was much of a um plan that was in front of us all the time but i really am hoping that these documents like the comprehensive plan, the downtown plan, the streetscape framework, and our strategic action plan are documents that we more and more use to drive our decisions or at least consciously say that's in our plan but we're not going to follow it. No, no when we're doing that, when we're deviating from our, our own plans and why and maybe they need to be changed so that we keep those documents more uh, living in front of us. Um, do you want to hear about all the projects that I talked about yesterday? No. <laughs> okay. Laura, I just yes. have one question about the active transportation committee. Like, sure. How are you forming that committee? Like, where are you selecting? We are intending to invite. <laughs> Let me flip back into my notes um, from earlier today. So currently, we have, um, Abby has offered to be part of that group. We also, internally on staff, we have um, Scott Buning for Community Development. We have Bill Kellum from the Streets Department. Gary Holm will be um, joining us. We um, will have a member of the Police Department. We have a member of the Fire Department because he happens to be Chief Dykey, the liaison to our Bicycle Commission. We have two members of the Bicycle Commission who are part of that group. We also have um, a representative from the Batavia Park District. In addition to that, there is a gentleman, Troy Simpson, who is a planner with the county, but is also at, uh, 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 the uh, planning representative on the uh, Kane and Kendall Council of Mayors. And he happens to also act as a uh, technical liaison to our Bicycle Commission. And so we thought he would be a valuable member too. Um, we are going to contact the Homestead to see if we could get a senior uh, volunteer to be part of that steering committee. And then um, Abby knows someone in, um, in uh, disability community who is going to be looking um, at 
those aspects of it. We're gonna contact the Geneva Park District because certainly we have areas of our community that are under the jurisdiction of the Geneva Park District. Uh, plan Commissioner, uh, Main Street, the Chamber, uh, Business Owner, member of the Batavia Environmental Commission, and um, uh, the school district, and the public library. And if you can think of anyone else that we maybe should include on that steering committee, we certainly would. Uh, if I could make a recommendation. Yes. Maybe a student from the high school. High school's on there, yep. <laughs> because they tend to take different modes of transportation. Yes, contacting both the high school was mentioned, and then also there is a uh, biking group that is in Rotolo Middle, Middle School, and they were going to see if try to get a member from there as well. Okay, does anybody have any others? I know, sir, if you had any questions or anything tonight for matters from the public or anything you showed up late I just wanted to offer if you wanted to say anything okay so if we have no others then I'll need a motion to go into executive session for collective bargaining so moved second motion by your second by Solfa roll call please Hewer. aye Sarone aye Vogelsinger Aye. Miller? Aye. Rosado? Aye. Beck? Aye. Connolly? Aye. Chanson? Sofa? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Barron? Aye. Lehman? Aye. Ayazi? Aye. And Malay? Aye. Motion carried 13 to 0. Okay. Right. Thank you. I will see you in the next meeting. Do you want to take a...